thank organizers for this opportunity to come here again and to give talk to the students. <coughs> so in fact, this talk um, came out of some questions which were asked on the previous conference, and uh, it was too late when I realized that the people who asked it didn't come here. So anyways, I, I will try to, to give such a talk and so see what happens. All right, so uh, my talk is about uh, the subject of beta and and so I will try to be as explicit as possible. So this subject has a lot of connection to many things, and I will try to just only mention those, but put on the board very explicit things. So uh, let me first start with a question which I'm going to study. So this is called Gaden model, and so the, the problem is as follows. So you start with a, say, simple real algebra, finite dimensional simple real algebra, my field is always C here. I have no roots of unity. Well, roots of unity are there, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, this is not what I'm concerned about. So my semi-simple algebra G, and then I, I have very minimal notations about this. This is a universal Alpine algebra of G. I have roots. These are simple roots. My rank will be R. And uh, maybe I will use event eventually uh, Chevalier generators as we know it, and this is all I really need. Um, you can think about this LN, for example, if you wish. Then um, my data for start to start the problem is a bunch of irreducible representations. Finite dimensional irreducible representations, they are parameterized by highest weights, and so I'm going to denote L lambda uh, a reducible representation of highest weight lambda for this algebra. And so what I start with, I start with a tensor product of several such representations. <coughs> and uh, for each representation, I choose a complex parameter. So uh, these numbers are complex numbers. And uh, the, well, the only condition is that they are not equal to each other. So they are the same complex numbers. Then if I have such a data, I can define uh, Gaden Hamiltonians. So Gaden Hamiltonians are defined as follows. First of all, I have uh, this uh, <coughs> element omega. So omega is uh, the Casimir operator which belongs to the uh, second uh, tensor pow power of universal melting algebra. So this is just the standard Casimir operator. So you can think about it, for example, GLN, then omega is. Eij tensor Eji like this. So this is just you, you, you take you take a basis, then you take a dual basis, and that's what you get. And then you can define the Casimir operators, uh, the the uh, operators like this. So you just. So here the notation is, uh, I think, standard. So omega ij is this operator acting in the ith and j copy in this representation. So these guys belong to the endomorphism of this representation. So these are just linear operators. And uh, a very simple exercise, which you can do as I speak probably, is to show that these guys <coughs> And so the question I'm concerned about is very simple. I have a family of commuting matrices. If my parameters are real, then these matrices are even symmetric matrices and they are even diagonalizable matrices in that case. So anyways, what I'm concerned about the question is, my question is, diagonalize those matrices at the same time or find common eigenvalues, eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Okay, so it may seem as a, if you haven't seen it before, it may seem like a random question, but actually there is a big, big history how this model appears. So the origin is by, so it's called Gaden model, Gaden Hamiltonians. And so Gaden introduced it in around 70, uh, but now, nowadays these Hamiltonians have been obtained for many different reasons, uh, from many different sources. For example, you can, so these Hamiltonians, they are just <coughs> uh, 
coming from the Cape Nizhnik Zamolochikov equation in conformal field theory, or uh, they, they come from uh, this um, by state field correspondence by uh, uh, what is it uh, from a vertex operator algebra uh, uh, corresponding to the affine G on critical level. So this is again, again I guess my uh, excuse to be here in this vertex operator uh, uh, conference. So, anyways, there are many, many different reasons why this, this question is important. But in the end, this is just a bunch of finite dimensional matrices, and you want to find eigenvalues and eigenvectors. That's it. So this is a problem from linear algebra 351, as it is called in my university. And so you can ask, you know, some students to just do it. And uh, probably you will not get too far, uh, but at least I can start by saying a few things. So first of all, this, this problem, um, yes, I maybe I should mention that there are also higher than Hamiltonians. So these are other operators, which can be also written in some way, which commute with HIs. And then uh, you can diagonalize a larger family of, of, of Hamiltonians, if you wish. But for me, this is just enough for now. And what I want to first do a very simple remark is that HI are actually block diagonal. And so, in fact, they commute with uh, UG action, diagonal action in this module. And so, therefore, all I have to do is I, have to, I can restrict my attention only to the space of singular vectors, the ones which are killed by EI operators. And so, therefore, what I'm going to do is I'm going to restrict my attention to the space of weight lambda. So, these are vectors in here of weight lambda. That's where HI act by, by this weight. And I also take singular vectors here. And so, all I need to do is to solve uh, now my, my problem in a, small subs in a small space. So, this is a smaller space. And so I can try that. Uh, so lambda, if I want to have a non-trivial space, then lambda will have this form. So this is always, as you know very well, so it has this form. <coughs> I goes from 1 to R, where Li are non-negative integers. And uh, so this is my problem. Now, uh, to better answers. So better ansatz is a powerful method, or a very interesting me method, which is physical method, uh, how to solve this problem. So the story, the history of better ansatz is very, very long. The start of that is 1931, actually, way before the Gaudet model was introduced. And uh, it was motivated by physics, so a physicist, uh, so Bethan was a physicist, and so he was solving a, a slightly different model. But anyway, after that, uh, there was a lot of develop there were a lot of developments, and people were able to generalize his method to many, many, many models. And the, the main the key word here is well, Beth is the key person, but Anzat singular, yes. So and beta and Anzat uh, means uh, substitution in German, I guess, or so it means that we are going to look for eigenvectors in a certain prescribed form. So that's what ansatz means. And so now let me describe for you how it works in this particular setting. <clears throat> okay, so there are two things I have to introduce here. So one thing is called the weight function. And so this is weight function. Well, it has many other names. Some people call it uh, wave function. Some people call it on shell, of, oh, sorry, off shell, off shell wave functions and so on. But nevertheless, this is just a function which I'm going to define for you like that. So first of all, uh, <clears throat> I'm going to take uh, auxiliary variables. So my auxiliary variables, they will, have, they will be called t's, and the number of them is dictated by those numbers. So I'm going to take auxiliary variables, so t1. So first color, so alpha 1 corresponds to the first color. So I have auxiliary variables corresponding to the first color. Then I have auxiliary variables corresponding to the second color. Then I have all my other auxiliary variables corresponding to all colors. L, R, R. 
And then uh, given the collection, so these are just numbers, if you wish, uh, these are complex numbers. Uh, given such a collection, I'm going to construct a vector in my space in the following way. So first of all, I break these guys into some graph. And so this graph is kind of a forest, so, uh, or maybe grass, I would say, because that, these don't branch here. So anyway, what I start is, I start with point which is, this point which are these. So Z ends, the ones which I have. And then to each one of them, I'm going to connect some of my variables. So I'm going to take almost my variables and just connect them one by one to each of those uh, uh, nodes. So for example, here maybe I connect T maybe to one, for example. Then I connect maybe T to two, for example. And maybe, I don't know, T one R. Maybe here I connect T3, 1, and maybe here I connect T1, 1. one. <clears throat> and so all of them have to be connected here. And so such a picture I will call P. And so there are many such possibilities, many such pictures I can take. And for each P, I'm going to denote a vector. So this is WP. And this vector is this. So you take vectors d1, uh, so I'll, I'm going to say, so uh, say v2. So these are highest weight vectors of representations v1, v lambda 1, and v lambda n. So let me call these vectors v1, vn, these are just highest weight vectors. And then those guys tell me how to act on them by, uh, by, by my operators fi's. So here I have color 1, so therefore I act by f1. Then I have color 2, I act F2. Then I have color R, I act by FR. On the second one, I act by color 1, so therefore F1. And then on the last one, I act by 1, okay, F1. And so therefore, I just act by those F operators on each factor, and that gives me a vector in my space V. And moreover, it has correct weight. It has weight lambda. Well, it's not a singular vector, but it just has a correct weight. Yes, clear, just just like that. <clears throat> so I don't understand. So for the Z two, you have the T three. Yes. T, the T3. Label three. So upper la upper label responds to the color. Corresponds so what is to the, the color that is which one of the So T one three is standing here and so this is color is still one, so it's F one. And what does the three do? So well I have to I have several variables of that color, and I'm going to write down what it does in a second. For this vector, it does nothing. So lower indices mean nothing for that vector. Okay, but now there is also a function. Uh, let me call it function fp. <coughs> so the function fp is just a rational function where I write product for each arrow. So for this arrow, I write 1 over... Uh, a, so t2, 1 minus z1. For this error, I write 1 over t2, 2 minus t2, 1. And then for this error, I write 1 over t1, r minus t2, 2. So for each error, I write where it starts minus where it ends. And for this one, I write 1 over t3, 1 minus z2. For this one, I write 1 over uh, t1, 1 minus Zn. So you see here it matters. The lower indices matter. So this is the product. And then what I do is then I symmetrize. And so when I say symmetrize, I mean always I symmetrize with respect to lower indices of the same color. So it means I symmetrize with respect to these variables, with respect to these variables, and with respect to these variables simultaneous, uh, separately. This is here and here. So this is sum of, of, of all Maybe better just try to symmetrize here. <clears throat> so this is sum of all permutations. You have SL1, SL2, SLR, and you just do that. So this is a function. <clears throat> and then finally, I can determine, uh, this is what we call beta function, W, depending on T. And so what it is, this is summation of all such possible P assignments 
when you multiply fp times wp. So this is now a vector again in v lambda, but now it has coefficients. So it is a rational function of all variables, t's and z's. So this is what, what is called the weight function. So this is the weight function. And so this is the ansatz for the solution of that beta ansatz system. So we are looking for, for eigenvectors of that form. So we want somehow to have, uh, to have a vector written in that form. And we have to specify what our t variables are for that. So the question is how to specify those. And the answer is given by uh, what is called beta ansatz equations. And they come from the master function. So the next object I have to introduce is the master function. And so the master function is always phi. And uh, this is such a thing. So it's a product. And then you have uh, t i j minus z k. And so product over i j k. <coughs> and what you have here, lambda k i j. So let me write here once and for all who are they. So this is scalar product of <coughs> lambda k with alpha j. So these are these indices. And then you have product Tij minus Tks. And here you have alpha i, alpha j, alpha s. <coughs> and we see a minus sign here. And so here the product over all i, j, k, and s, but you can have the same pair, obviously, not to make it zero. So i, j, k, s, but i, j is not equal to k, s. So this is a this is a phase function, and yeah, usually people also divide it by kappa. For beta ansatz equations, it's not very important, but nevertheless, let me divide by kappa. Kappa is again some complex parameter, zero complex parameter. <coughs> so this this is a phase function, and then <coughs> the beta ansatz equations are just the equations for the critical points of these functions. And so the theorem of the beta ansatz theorem. So it says the following. So if t, so let me call this all this t, this is this all sequence of all this t. If t is a critical point of function phi, so what I mean by this is that t phi over phi T i j g t i j phi over phi <coughs> zero. Then w of t is an eigenvector of the determinants. And I can specify also eigenvalue, but I'm not going to worry about this. So this is a theorem. <clears throat> and uh, so again, I have to say that there is a long story about, about all this. So how, how people came up with this function. So this function is also, probably I should say that here it appeared in Schechtman and, and Varshinka in, in a full generality. Before that, there were several other works of, by different people. Uh, so. Uh, this theorem uh, it's, it's proved by many people uh, for again for different reasons. So maybe I should mention here uh, uh, again maybe Varshink and, and Rishetikin. Rishetikin, Varshinka, and then I also have to mention uh, Fagin, Frankel, Edward Frankel, and Rishetikin by a different method. So in, 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 uh, in other models, there are other people who did this, but here is other people who took such a theorem. And so, uh, well, so this is the, the recipe for you how to solve, uh, how to solve this problem. So first you solve this, this system of equations for all i and j. This is, should be a critical point of the, of the master function. <coughs> then you substitute to that weight function and you get your eigenvectors. And so there is this theorem uh, or 
conjecture. This is called the beta ansatz completeness. And so, so what, what about z? Is w of t also a function of z? Double this? Yeah. No, w of t is the function of z. Z are here. Right. right. So this is a function of t and z. But what I'm saying is that z are fixed. Mm -hmm. And for t, I substitute the solutions of that system. But is it z dependent on z? It, it, it depends on z, yes. Okay. It depends on z. Of course, those vectors depend on z very heavily. <coughs> and so the completeness says that, uh, well, so what we want to claim is that uh, the number of solutions of beta and that's equation, so these are solutions of these equations for critical points called beta and that's equations, this system <coughs> uh, equals t, which is dimension of this space I'm interested in. And the vectors we obtain from these solutions uh, form a basis in, 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 in this space. So this is the usual statement of completeness. So here again, I have to make a few comments. So, well, first of all, when I say number of solutions, well, this is some jargon now. So solutions, so the system of equations is always symmetric with respect to permutation of variables of the same color. And so when I say uh, number of solutions, what I mean orbits of solutions uh, with respect to action of this symmetric group. So I don't distinguish between different solutions. In fact, they give the same vector because this vector, this vector is symmetric with respect to each uh, permutation of variables of the same color. So this is first thing. And the uh, second thing is that um, what is the status of this, of this uh, 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 conjecture? So first of all, uh, this is a theorem or conjecture. It is false in general. So false as stated in general. If it is false, you have to do a little bit more work to try to complement it with some extra work. And it has been done for many cases. But very often it is a correct statement. And then this correct statement usually still is wrong if you do it for all z variables. So usually, so the usually means you pick up your weights, lambda 1, lambda n. Um, and then the conjecture will be true for generic z1, zn. So it means outside of some uh, algebraic set. <clears throat> so this is the usual statement of, of, of the conjecture. It is true that if you get the correct number of solutions, then you always get a basis. This, is, this part is true. The, the hard part is to see how many solutions you got and if you have enough or not. OK, so this is, uh, this is the state, the status of, of all these beta and dots. That's how this method works. So now let me go to some very special example. <coughs> here and so my I will take one very simple example and I will take SL2 example I will take n equal 2 and so uh, in this case I have L say M tensor LN so these are SL2 modules M and N are integers And uh, so I will take weight m plus n minus 2l. Yeah. So n is 2 or n? N, n is 2. Uh, ah. <laughs> too bad. Um, OK, lambda 1, lambda 2. Yes. And then I take uh, lambda 1 plus lambda 2. And I will take also minus 2. So minus 2 times 2, minus 2 alpha. So it means I have two variables, t, t1 and t2. Just two variables down, and I have uh, lambda 1 and lambda 2. So lambda 1, lambda 2. <coughs> so in this, in this uh, setup, I can write down this function uh, explicitly. So what is w of t? So this is a, a vector in my space. What does it look like? It looks like this. So you have uh, t1 minus z1, 1 over t2 minus z2. 
times f squared p1 tensor p2 plus you have 1 over p1 minus z1 1 over p2 minus z1 plus opposite times times f v1 f v2 and plus 1 over t2 minus z1 t1 minus z2 1 over t2 minus z2 v1 tends of f square p <coughs> so this is such a vector so three terms this this and that these are the corresponding functions and so this is just the weight function corresponding on two variables f squared f squared thank you and the bet ansatz equations look like this. Uh, you have uh, 2 t1 minus t2 minus lambda 1 t1 minus z1 minus lambda 2 t1 minus z2 equals 0. And you have like this. So this is the bet ansatz equations. Uh, uh, which, which I wrote there in general way. So you have to solve this, find T1, T2, substitute here, and then get your, your basis of solutions, uh, basis of eigenvectors for, for this gradient momentum. Okay, so this is it. But now you can stop for a second and, uh, and just ask yourself. So I'm, I'm, look, I'm looking for to find eigen vectors of Gaudian Hamiltonian acting in this space. But uh, this space has dimension 1. If you go to the singular, well, sometimes it is 0 if lambda 1 over lambda 2 is small, but in general this is 1, one dimensional space. Okay, so I'm trying to diagonalize operators acting in one dimensional space. This is kind of lame, it seems. Uh, and so, people always ask me, why do I do that? <laughs> and so, today, my, my main message, which I would like to just promote, all my talk is about this message, is that in this case, it is still important to do that ansatz. Even though it is one-dimensional, even though there is no, no question about, say, eigenvectors. Well, there is something about eigenvalues, but eigenvalues also can be computed very simply in this case through Casimir values. This is not a big deal. But still, diagonalizing the trivial operator has some meaning. And so what are the reasons why would I want to do that? Well, so there are many, many reasons. And so one maybe main reason uh, for starters, uh, so one good reason is, uh, so I'm just going to list a few reasons. And so one good reason is this. So first of all, uh, of course, uh, this is a very simple case when I have just two, uh, two factors and one dimensional space. But in general, I can, uh, I can reduce, so general statement of beta and that's completeness can be reduced to cases like this, to case n equal 2, usually. So in fact, you have here parameters z1, z2, zn, and if you start pushing them together, you will see that if they go together with different speeds, really every time, um, you know, you see in the limit, n equal 2 systems. And if you can solve n equal 2 systems, then you can deform a solution and prove that beta dot completeness is correct for, for large systems. So if I can not just find eigenvectors and eigenvalues of this, but if I can prove that this eigenvector actually has a form coming from beta and zats, then uh, you know, this system of equations will be then generalized, generalized, deformed, deformed, and then eventually I will get completeness of beta and that's in, 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 a, in a large <coughs> situation. So, if K 
can solve uh, n equal to can solve everything. Uh, so this uh, general n. And so, but we need to solve. But this this solve means solve by better ansatz. It's not enough to know eigenvectors and eigenvalues. It's important to know the t's they are coming from here. And so this this actually was part of many uh, many many different uh, in many different situations you can do. And so when can I have dimension one case? So dimension equal one case can be done. Well, where, where do you find again? So you, you take several uh, modules and you want to find a way, uh, so a multiplicity one somewhere. So how to do that? Well, one most common example is this. You take just SLN case, SLR case, and then you take, for example, uh, L uh, multiple, so K omega one times arbitrary. So if you take symmetric power of the, of the vector representation for SLR, then this uh, representation has all multiplicities 1. And so this tensor product will have all these multiplicities 1 when you decompose it as a, as a tensor product. So all this, so this is either 1 or 0, depending on your lambda here, all this. So this is one very good example when you can do that. And so if you can solve bad ansatz here, then what? And so this is a work of, you know, there are several papers on the subject. So there's a paper of Archenko in SL2. So then uh, I did it with him uh, for SLN. Then there is also a paper with uh, Charles Young. Young and, uh, you know, well, you know, I should be before, actually, each other here. So this is the case of GLMN, it's a very similar thing. Then there's also a paper with my student Liu and watching in, in types BCD. So when we really start doing it and just solving L equal 1, and then the conclusion is that beta and that is complete. And what you do is you, you, you take this representation many, many, many times. Well, usually it's just vector representation is enough. So for generic, so you can show it for generic Z1, Z1. So you can do it for A, B, C, D type, for all types, you can do that. And so, uh, why is it good? Well, it's a start of another project, which I'm not going to talk about. So then what you want to do is you want to understand those, those better vectors in a different way and connect it to geometry and then prove more and more and more properties. But then, nevertheless, this is one reason why this bet ansatz can be done. But this is not the only, not, not the only reason. So let me just give you some more examples to do this. <coughs> So another reason. So the second reason, well, so this system of equations is quite complicated. It has many variables in it, many equations in it. But if you know that solution is unique, <coughs> so you can expect that you can solve it explicitly. And again, what I'm saying is you cannot solve explicitly for t's, but you can solve explicitly for symmetric functions of t's. So there is a symmetry, of, and you can find the orbit itself, but uh, you can find the symmetric polynomial. So you can find a polynomial which looks like this, ti, say, 1. So i, 1, from l1. So if you take this polynomial, the coefficients of the symmetric uh, expressions of ti, and the coefficients of these guys are expected be explicit. But explicit means what? <coughs> so the solution is unique, and if I vary zi around, I should not get any monotony or anything like this. So it means my function, my, my ti, ti1, those, those guys should be, uh, well, meromorphic functions. 
but we are in algebraic situation, so we expect them to be rational functions. So rational functions of this lambda i k and z i. And so, well, so we expect them to be like that, but to solve them, it's not, it's not uh, well, completely trivial. There are different tricks and different recursions, and you write and you try to solve it. But uh, it's always nice in mathematics when you try to solve a complicated system of equations and you come up with an explicit answer, which, is, which looks like a rational function. In many cases, those coefficients also nicely factorize and they have very nice form. And moreover, uh, very often, these polynomials actually have some meaning. So these polynomials so have some meaning. And so again, let me just say a few of them. So if I do SL2 case, and again, the case which I mentioned here, so if I do L lambda 1 tensor L lambda 2, then the corresponding polynomial is actually Jacobi orthogonal polynomial. Jacobi orthogonal polynomial has exactly two weights, and so these are these weights. Jacobi orthogonal polynomial. So this is a classical object, and uh, you can enjoy it, but you cannot actually probably say much new about Jacobi polynomial or about your beta ansatz using this connection. However, already the next uh, case, um, uh, already the next case, uh, if you do GLM, SLM case, so uh, if you do the case of SLM, so this is work, by the way, this is the work of Parchenko, and this is the work some myself and Parchenko. Which year? Huh? Which year? Uh, this is uh, 1994. Um, so this is uh, later, this is probably 2004, maybe, like this. If you do SLM things, then these orthogonal polynomials are related to um, what is called Jacobi Pinero. So and these guys are actually multiple orthogonal polynomials. And so Jacobi Pinero polynomials, well, this is a version of orthogonal polynomials. They are also defined by orthogonality conditions to certain functions, uh, not as simple as Jacobi polynomial, but some straightforward generalization. And uh, in fact, if you know that they come from here, well, you get with that something, which you can say about these polynomials. So again, this is, will be a different talk, so I'm not going to be there. Uh, but I'll just keep it like that. So uh, some polynomials appear and uh, they are nice and you can study them. If you do quantum case, then you do Kujakovi polynomials, little Kujakovi polynomials, and other things. This is only the Gaden model. <coughs> so anyways, what you get, you get very interesting answers solving this system just with, with, without any regards to, to something else. And finally, uh, one more reason why I do this. And so, uh, let me just say about integrals. Okay, so... Uh, uh, yes, so... I will consider the following thing. So, let me consider a complex. So, uh, so I'll consider a complex where uh, the chains of this complex are what? So, these are just... Um, these are uh, I forms and variables T, I, J with rational coefficients and uh, poles uh, at, uh, at, at most, of, of order at most one, simple poles of order at most one on the diagonals Tij minus Zk and Tij minus Tks. And so here, in fact, I am allowing not all of them, but only the ones which appear in my master function. So here I want to have alpha j and alpha s to be non-zero. 
So these are connected nodes of Dinkin diagrams. And uh, here, uh, well, I don't want alpha jk, alpha kg is non zero. So if I consider such forms, then uh, I can construct a differential. So this is differential. And so the differential uh, d phi, so it goes from forms of order i to the forms of order i plus 1. And it's very simple. So if I have a form omega, then I multiply it by phi, I take derivative, I take a differential, and then I just divide by phi inverse. Omega goes to phi omega d phi inverse. So this is such a called twisted differential, very simple thing. So phi is my master function, so I just multiply by this, and, uh, and differentiate, and then extract phi function back. So then it gives me a complex, uh, uh, so of course d squared is zero, and so I can ask myself about cohomology of that complex. And so, well, so this is a very kind of naive complex, and the first one which comes to mind, and I'm sorry to report that I still do not know the answer to the cohomology of that very simple complex. So what I, what, but what I'm interested in actually is the, uh, the top cohomology of this complex. So the top cohomology, of course, so here I goes from zero up to L, and L is L1 plus LR, so this is the number of T variables I have here. And so in a top complex, I have the following two conjectures. Well, so first of all, well, before uh, from the conjectures, let me define a map. So first of all, I have a map phi. So what I'm going to do is, so I have, if you remember, I had these functions f p. So for each p, which was an assignment of all these variables to, the, to z variables, I had this product and symmetrization. I forgot to say that, yes, this, this form should have to be skew-symmetric. Skew-symmetric forms in t, in t variables. So you have pi, uh, so fp, uh, so I, what, I, what I do is I take all these forms fp for all p, uh, I take the span of them and multiply them by all top form. I'm going to project it to the hn, hl of my complex, just sending this fp to fp dt1, taking the classes t, uh, l, r, r. So I have this map, these guys go there. Okay, so now conjectures. <coughs> I'm sorry, question. So you basically consider the configuration space of the line bundle over that space which is defined by your function phi, right? So if that's a differential in the... So, okay, bundles or no bundles. So these are just functions, these are rational functions uh, with, with such poles of order one, right? And so uh, what I'm considering forms is coefficients which are... So this is a form with such coefficient. Sorry, I forgot phi. What is phi? Phi was the... Phi was a master function. Ah, that was an original master function. Original master function. So phi is the master function. And so fp is this rational function which I get from, from this configuration. And then I, I can just, you know, multiply it by the top term. And this is... And project it to the homology, homology class. Yeah, so it's got the homology with coefficients in the line bound. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so this is what I have. And so, and then the conjectures are... So first of all, uh, conjecture. So first conjecture is that dimension of image of pi is equal to dimension of our space D. So I recall, who was D? D was the dimension of the space of, um, so this is uh, right now, the dimension of V lambda singular. So this is dimension of my space. And so these forms, which I have here, uh, so you can you can you can actually see that uh, the dimension they span is 
this. And so the conjecture is that it is not smaller. So this is, this is one statement. I think this is more or less a theorem, but this morning I was not able to locate this theorem anywhere. So it will be a conjecture for today's talk. Uh, and so the second part is that uh, actually the map pi is surjective. Okay, so the second part is a conjecture, and uh, it is a conjecture only because I don't know counterexamples. So if I believe this is true and almost a theorem, then this one I think in general probably is wrong. But nevertheless, at the moment, this is written as a conjecture. And so certainly in good, in good situations, it is a correct conjecture uh, with some extra conditions, which maybe I don't have time to talk about. But so what? So suppose I have this conjecture. Suppose you compute for me this cohomology and you prove it correct. So then uh, in the case d equal 1, if this is true, then what we know is that this cohomology is one-dimensional. So that's what it says. If you combine them together, this is one, this is surjective, so this is this is one dimensional. This is one dimensional. Uh, so then H um, dimension of HL is one. And so what? Uh, then uh, if dimension HL is equal to one, then that means that there is only one top term and the rest is homologous to that. So in particular, so it means that, for example, if I take phi function itself, and then uh, if I take from that a multiple, some multiple of the function, say 1 over t product 1 over ti minus zj times phi, e, uh, 1 here, for example, product of y from 1 to L1, then, then the, up to some constant, this should be a differential. So it should be, is, is a derivative. Okay, so what am I, am I getting to? I'm getting to the following conjecture. <coughs> so what I'm going to do is this. Let me define an integral. So this is the integral. Uh, this depends on lambda i k and uh, everything else, uh, which, you know, uh, the, the type of the algebra. So this is this. It's just take integral f phi dt1 dt l r l r. So this is an, an integral phi and depends on lambdas. And now, what is this integral in, uh, contour of integration? So the contour of integration here is a hard part, but nevertheless, so what I want it to be, no boundary. So this is a contour, which is in the complement of all these diagonals, which has no boundary. And then a trivial, a trivial contour. So it's not completely clear how to determine it. In some cases you can, in some cases you have to work. But suppose you have it. Then this statement tells me that this guy satisfies recursions so namely what I can do is I can take this guy and I can increase it or decrease it by one because phi and phi divided by this they are homologous so they are they are di di difference is derivative so integral will kill this, this difference and so therefore, this guy satisfies recursions. And if it satisfies recursions, then uh, I can actually compute it. So this is a conjecture. Again, one of the conjecture is that this can be computed as a product of Euler gamma functions. So the statement of, the, of, of the, the message here is that if I'm in this situation, in this good situation, then I can write down an integral, integral of phi, 
which can be ex ex computed explicitly. And so, the main example of that thing, of course, is the celebrated Selberg integral. And so, this is my example. So, this is SL2 example. So, that pi function, uh, so I have two points, n equal 2, and I, have, I can rescale them to make z1 equals 0 and z2 equals 1. And then, so then my pi function is product of ti. I goes from 1 to L to the power some number, lambda 1. Well, usually it's called la alpha minus 1 in the Selberg integral. This is the weight at 0. And then you have the weight at 1. And then you have Ti minus product Ti minus Tj to the power, and the usual annotation is 2 gamma. So this gamma is actually... Uh, related to kappa in the master function. And so then uh, the statement is that if you do the integral of phi and uh, your cycle of integration here also can be specified, <coughs> tl dt1 dtl, then, then yes, then the bell sounds, uh, then it is a product i goes from 0 to n minus 1, gamma function of alpha plus i gamma, gamma beta plus i gamma, gamma 1 plus 1 plus uh, uh, gamma i divided by gamma alpha plus beta plus n minus i plus l plus i minus 1 gamma, gamma 1 plus gamma. And so this is a famous Selberg integral in this case. Of course, Selberg did it in 1944, way before the Den model was, was discovered or discussed or, or something. But this integral now plays a very, very important role in many places of mathematics. And so I would suggest for you, if you didn't read it, to read a paper by Forrester and Warnar. So this is a, in bulletins of AMS about 2007. 45 pages about the importance of this integral for different places. So it's a very important integral. So, and, uh, well, later, Warner recently proved the same thing. So did the SLM uh, generalization of this integral. And uh, his proof was not using such derivatives, but it was rather using a heavy machinery of McDonald's polynomial. And you get it. But in general, no, you have to you have to, to work. Depending on your situation, depending on your root system, depending on the consideration of hyperplanes, depending on what your n is, yes, this cycle is, is something. But uh, well, they exist. So. There is also this Aomoto integral. Well, Aomoto integral is a slight generalization of yeah, Selberg integral. Yeah. So can you does it show up in your work? It does not, though it is very close, and I can say something about it. It certainly related, seems to be related to n equal 3 case, though dimension there is 2, but somehow it's still computable. So there is maybe some other reason for this. Let's thank uh, you again. We'll uh, resume in nine minutes uh, at uh, 4.35.